This is San Cristobal de las Casas, in the south of Mexico. It sounds unbelievable, but residents here on average drink more than two liters of soft drinks every day, especially Coca-Cola. More available than even fresh water. Biggest consumers of Coca-Cola in the world. More than 800 liters of Coke in a year. Too much sugar is killing more and more residents. La principal causa de muerte es la diabetes. Most people do not have access to drinking water in the middle of the Chiapas region, a place named the Land of Springs, where there's lots of rain and big rivers. How can that be? What's happening? In San Cristobal and the surrounding area, street signs suggest the manipulation of indigenous communities. A water-guzzling factory symbolizes the exploitation of the region, a war over the basis of all life. And at the heart of it is a mega conglomerate with ties to the highest ranks of Mexican politics. Donations that I got came from people uh, of Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola is everywhere. Over 35% have diabetes. You wouldn't have any drinking water without this water in the house. No. This is your life in weeks, if you're lucky enough to turn 80 years old. And this is the amount of time you spend on your career, 80,000 hours. You probably want to spend all of that time on something meaningful that makes a big positive difference in the world. 80,000 hours is also the name of today's sponsor, a nonprofit that wants to help you figure out how to do that. Their 2023 career guide draws on over 10 years of research and gives you concrete practical advice to help you create a full career plan that you feel confident in. They have a website that provides you all of that research a podcast, and also a newsletter. They have a job board that provides hundreds of open listings for potential high-impact career paths, and all of their advice and research is free forever. So if you're not sure how to do something with those cubes that feels meaningful, helps others, and makes a positive difference, maybe check out their in-depth career guide at 80,000hours.org slash fern. Life is short, but what you do with your decreasing time is up to you. The Chiapas region has rivers here and here, and it rains a lot. But still, there is almost no clean drinking water for the population, especially in San Cristobal. How many of you struggle to get water every week? We sent a camera team to the region to get an independent picture and to do an interview with an expert. The little tap water that is available is full of chlorine. This chemical kills germs and pathogens, but it tastes like a swimming pool and can be harmful over a long period of time. So some people are more likely to buy their water from these trucks, but where this water comes from and how drinkable it is, is often unclear. Bottled water is available in supermarkets and shops, but Coca-Cola is always available, often at almost the same exact price. Literally in this fridge, you can find more Coca-Cola than water. It's absurd. Two rows of water, four, five, six, seven, eight rows of Coke. For some residents in San Cristobal in the region, it is simply easier to get Coca-Cola than water. So let's be honest. Imagine having the choice between undrinkable pool water, risky tanker water, expensive bottled water, or a cool, refreshing Coke. Which choice would you make? So, how can this all be? Where's all the water? Why is Coca-Cola so popular? What does this do to the residents who casually drink two liters a day? And how did it even come to this? What is Mexican politics doing? Let's begin with the first question. On the outskirts of town, there is a Coca-Cola bottling plant. Since 1994, this plant has been allowed to extract over a million liters per day from the groundwater. According to various environmental organizations and some residents, this factory is primarily responsible for the water shortage in the city. For context, around 216,000 people live in San Cristobal. The factory essentially uses 4.6 liters of groundwater per inhabitant per day. In April 2017, and again in September 2020, some citizens took to the streets demanding the end of Coca-Cola in the region. Coca-Cola and its partner company, FEMSA, countered that their bottling plant is not to blame. Water is scarce for other reasons. There's just poor infrastructure, lack of government investment, and climate change. That's all true. Historically, water for San Cristobal has been obtained from rivers and springs in the surrounding areas. Since the 1970s, the city's population has grown rapidly. Unfortunately, the city does not have a functioning sewage system or sewage treatment plant. Feces and garbage from the growing population are simply dumped into rivers. This makes the water undrinkable and harmful to health. 
In the area around San Cristobal, numerous forests were also cut down, swamp areas were filled, and fields were created. Climate change is also causing higher temperatures, and there's less rain. But when it rains, it really does. Extreme rainfall then removes fertile soil, and the ground becomes dry, hard, and infertile. Ecologically, the region was brutally run down, and at the same time, sewage treatment plants, sensible storage facilities, etc. were simply not built for decades. But none of this changes the specific situation in San Cristobal. The city's residents have no drinking water, and deep beneath a volcano that borders the city to the west, there's a massive reservoir of groundwater, a reservoir from which Coca-Cola pumps millions of liters. Conagua, the National Water Authority, decides who can use the water. On their website, they warn about the effects of climate change and address the country's water shortage. But at the same time, the authority renewed the factory's license in 2005 without batting an eye, even though the water problems were already becoming apparent. In 2020, numerous nonprofits, climate change activists, and even the San Cristobal City Council have called on Conagua to revoke Coca-Cola's permit. Along the lines of, hey, we would like to use our groundwater ourselves now. Unfortunately, Conagua said no, because the city has rivers and springs in the surrounding area, and so on. If the license were withdrawn from the bottling plant, the water could in principle be used for the residents of the city. Let's remember, 4.6 liters per person per day. On a specifically created website that is now offline, the Coca-Cola company wrote that it is aware of the city's problems. To help, they have planted over 200,000 trees in the region and built 19 water tanks, 38 rooftop water collectors, and 35 efficient stoves that burn less wood. Oh, 60 orchards were also created. Does that make up for the 1 million liters of water per day? Anyway, this still all begs the question, why is there so much Coca-Cola everywhere in San Cristobal and the Chiapas? No, it's not just because there's a huge factory there. The Coca-Cola consumption is not just the fault of the bottling plant. The population of Mexico drinks the most soft drinks per person in the world, and the Coca-Cola company controls more than half of that market. Coca-Cola is incredibly popular in Mexico, but it wasn't always like that. The drink had been sold in the country for almost 100 years, but it wasn't until the 70s that it really became popular. In 1968, Coca-Cola was a sponsor of the Mexican Olympics. This was followed by a series of successful international commercials, especially this one. In 1994, the North American Free Trade Agreement came into force, which among other things, simplified doing business with the USA. As a result, Coca-Cola suddenly became incredibly cheap in Mexico, and business exploded. But Chiapas is another special case. Almost 30% of the population there has indigenous roots. Since the 1960s, Coca-Cola has repeatedly launched local marketing campaigns targeting this indigenous population. The advertisements often had religious undertones. Not only that. This is Dr. Jaime Page Pliego. He is an ethnomedical scientist at the University of San Cristobal, and he researches the health of the local indigenous population. Coca-Cola has sponsored numerous local signs, featuring models in traditional indigenous garb in the region and using their language. Here you can see how two men wear exactly this traditional clothing. And here again. This sheepskin jacket is called a chui. A FEMSA spokesman defended the signs to the New York Times. They would have been a sign of respect for the indigenous people. But was it actually about respect? Just in 2015, in a Mexican Coca-Cola advertising campaign, a bunch of white people went to an indigenous village and saved the poor residents with Coca-Cola for peace and unity. This included a hashtag and a tree for Christmas vibes. Didn't go so well back then. And an official complaint from rights groups saying the ad is racist. In any case, the company has had incredible success with its decades-long campaign in Chiapas. Thanks to a large network of micro-suppliers and traders, the drink is now available literally everywhere in the region, even in the most remote villages. On average, the population here drinks over five times more soft drinks than in the rest of Mexico or of the USA. Los Altos de Chiapas es la región del mundo donde más Coca-Cola se consume. The indigenous communities in the region are probably the most loyal Coca-Cola customers in the world. The Guardian published an impressive series of photos about this some time ago. 
But the soft drink is not just popular and omnipresent. Today, it is closely interwoven with the culture of the indigenous communities. Los refrescos de alguna manera en algún momento se incorporaron en, en, el, en los rituales, los rituales mayas. Some shamans use Coca-Cola to cure illnesses. Obviously, instead of healing, that much Coca-Cola actually has the opposite effect. If you drink more than two liters of soft drinks every day for years, it has catastrophic effects on your health. There are more than 200 grams of sugar in two liters of Mexican cola. That is four times as much as the recommended maximum daily dose in the U.S., 50 grams according to dietary guidelines for Americans. Too much sugar is bad for your teeth, can make you overweight, and depending on your lifestyle, contribute to many dangerous diseases, not least type 2 diabetes. And the indigenous population in Chiapas has a significantly higher risk of developing diabetes than the average American. There are several reasons for this. On the one hand, they simply have a genetic precondition for this. But on the other, the way of life of indigenous peoples in Mexico has changed significantly in the last century. Many of them have been displaced or lost their land due to environmental pollution. As a result, their diet has also changed, from homegrown fruit and vegetables to ready-made products and sweets. Their bodies are not used to the sugary diet. Soft drinks like cola are therefore particularly dangerous for the indigenous community. Diabetes is one of the leading causes of death in Mexico. But in Chiapas, the top four causes of death are all diseases related to excessive sugar consumption. Three of them have increased by over 60% within 10 years, one by 40%. The sugar is killing more and more people in San Cristobal and the surrounding areas. Esto de las refresqueras es, es un elemento pues, muy triste, ¿no? O sea, por más que se trabaja con la gente, no están dispuestos, incluso los diabéticos, no están dispuestos a dejar los refrescos. Many people don't believe that Coca-Cola is unhealthy. The soft drink has been with them their entire life, since early childhood. Los niños lloran porque no les dan Coca-Cola a la hora de la comida. This child from Chiapas is three years old and has already had four baby teeth extracted. Regarding the situation in Chiapas and San Cristobal, the Coca-Cola company wrote in a public statement that they agree that too much sugar is not good for anyone. That's why a large part of the global brand portfolio contains little or no sugar. And in Mexico too, products are constantly being adapted so that they contain less sugar. So you might be asking yourself, how did it come to this? The San Cristobal bottling plant and 48 others throughout Latin America are officially managed by Coca-Cola FEMSA. This is the largest franchise Coca-Cola bottler in the world. The corporation has quite a bit of power in Mexico, also due to good political connections. This is Vicente Fox. He was the CEO of Coca-Cola Mexico from 1975, and from 2000 to 2006, he was, well, the president of Mexico. My first donations that I got to start moving in politics came from uh, people uh, of Coca-Cola, from bottlers of Coca-Cola or for the company itself. So I got a lot of support, not only knowledge, not only uh, great experiences, but also they uh, contributed to my campaign at the very beginning. Paige Pliego suspects Fox played a key role in renewing the bottling plant's license in 2005. We were unable to independently verify this. According to many experts, during his six-year presidency, Fox certainly turned a blind eye when it came to regulating the soft drinks industry. It was already clear back then that soft drinks had an extremely negative effect on the health of the Mexican population. However, for a long time, there were no real political initiatives to reduce people's consumption. For example, in 2003, Fox ignored a proposal to impose a tax on soft drinks. The industry fears this kind of tax a lot, not because of a potentially lower income, but because it signals that Coca-Cola and Co. are dangerous to your health, like cigarettes, for example. In Mexico, there were also attempts to hang up educational posters in doctors' offices and hospitals. They would provide information about soft drinks and healthy diets. This initiative also failed because according to scientists involved, the industry aggressively opposed it. Instead, Coca-Cola and the Mexican government introduced the Ponte All 100 initiative in 2007 to encourage exercise. El cual también prescribe recomendaciones físicas y nutricionales para todos los participantes. According to the industry, it's not the liquid sugar that's the problem. If you do enough exercise, it would even out. That's not true. 
your diet is much more important for your weight than exercise. The fight against the soft drink tax continued long after Fox's presidency. The Coca-Cola company sponsored a public speech at a diabetes conference in 2013, in which a scientist spoke out against the tax. The organization the scientist belonged to was co-founded by Coca-Cola. The Mexican health minister also spoke out against the tax that same year. Before her political office, she was on the board of the Mexican Health Foundation, and they, in turn, worked systematically with Nestle, the Coca-Cola company, and the Dr. Pepper Snapple group. Nevertheless, the tax was finally introduced in January 14, and it is having an impact. Prices for soft drinks have risen slightly, and purchases have fallen slightly, but the country still has a long way to go. Hay una mentalidad curativa, no preventiva. Entonces no hay tales programas de salud, ni siquiera en la ciudad. We stared at this image from The Guardian for a long time during our research. It was taken in a shop in Chiapas. There, you can buy seven different sizes of Coca-Cola, six other soft drinks, and two sizes of water. The cola in the 500 milliliter glass bottle only costs one peso, about five cents more than the same size bottle of water. The 2.5 liter plastic cola costs even less per milliliter than the one liter bottle of water. All the products you see here are from the Coca-Cola company, also the water. And then we realize something. The Coca-Cola company can't lose. Whether you buy a Coke or Fanta or the equally expensive water, the main thing is that it is a product of the conglomerate. Bottled water has become a billion dollar business in Mexico over the past few decades. The country is one of the largest bottled water markets in the world. No other nation drinks more bottled water per capita. And right in the middle is Coca-Cola. Its own brand Ciel is the second most popular water in the country. At the same time, millions of Mexicans have no clean water from the tap, no alternative to the expensive bottles from the Coca-Cola company and other conglomerates. Many families in Mexico spend up to 10% of their income on water. According to the United Nations, this number should be a maximum of 3%. We asked Coca-Cola for a comment on all the topics in this video. We did not receive a response. Coca-Cola Mexico writes on the company website, translated, let's talk about water because every drop counts. Pretty cynical when you think about the residents of the Chiapas region, the people of San Cristobal. Access to clean drinking water is a human right, a right that these people have been denied. Coca-Cola is not responsible for the disastrous water supply in the region or the rest of the country, but the company benefits massively from it. It pumps out millions of liters of groundwater that could otherwise be clean drinking water for the people of San Cristobal, and from this water, the company makes even more expensive water and bottles, but above all, millions and millions of liters of cola. And people from this region with indigenous roots and a genetically increased risk of developing diabetes drink over two liters of this cola and other soft drinks per day, sometimes because the soft drink is an integral part of rituals and is considered supposedly healthy. And more and more of these people are dying from terrible diseases caused by excessive sugar consumption. To investors, the conglomerate's business in Mexico is seen as an incredible success that it wants to replicate elsewhere in Latin America. These are the facts. Do with it what you want. Hopefully you enjoyed this video. We started this channel just a few months ago and are so grateful for all of your support. You can find more of our content on screen.